Today we're gonna to show how to go from Figma to Tailwind CSS. And we're gonna start by looking at a site that I use a lot and go over some ideas for how we can simplify things, make them better, and kind of break them down into a real design. We're gonna start in Figma and we're gonna start with ESPN. So I'll give you, I'll give you kind of the breakdown of, of why I wanted to make this stream, why I wanted to come up with this project. If you've ever used ESPN for basketball, football, any sport, um, soccer, you might notice there's a lot going on. And at first, I didn't really love the design. Now that I've, I've dug into it more, I have an appreciation for it, but there's just a lot going on here. And really what I want when I come to this page is I wanna know who are we playing next and what is the schedule, what are the scores? Those are the two things that I really, really want. So today I'm gonna to show y'all how I took the original ESPN design and I ended up landing somewhere like this. This is kind of where I'm landing and I wanna talk through a bunch of design decisions I made to simplify down to this and then we're gonna convert it to Tailwind CSS. So let's start back here. Let's start with this design. Overall, there's some good stuff here. It's easy to see the schedule, but you know, honestly, I don't really care that much about the news. I don't really care about the team stats. I just wanna know, oh, there's a game today. And I wanna know, okay, we're five and zero. Oh. Like those are the things that I care about. So I was exploring this and I started to explore not only desktop web, but mobile web, mobile app, and other sites as well too. And what I found is that they all do things a little bit differently, each with their own strengths. So maybe just to start things off, I'll just kinda, we can write down some notes here on things that I think they're doing well and things I maybe think they're not doing well. Now, why am I doing this? It's extremely important for me to start with a base of what elements do I wanna bring and reuse from other designs or other places to get inspiration. This isn't a straight up one-to-one -one copy. It's not like I'm just gonna copy paste elements. I'm trying to get inspiration from how each different medium or other inspiration, um, other sites, how they handle, you know, maybe it's just the font choice they use. Maybe it's the colors they use. Maybe it's the spacing they use. I just pulled a couple different ideas here as I was browsing through the web. All of these things can kind of help me figure out a design that I like that's gonna work for the constraints that I want, right? So I think if I look at the desktop web here, I like that, it, it, I like that it's easy to see the schedule. I don't really like all of the uh, additional, <laughs> additional info, like news, stats, uh, slash ads and tickets. Like I don't really, I don't really need any of this stuff, right? I just, it's not important for me. All I wanna know is stats and schedule. Now, it is also nice, I will say, the um, ticker at the top, let's see if I can, it's not showing up my additional, I wanna get a, another line in here, we'll see if it works. That works too. <laughs> Um, current scores at the top, that's nice too. Like I, I enjoy that. So there's some things we can pull from here. Maybe some things not. One thing I found interesting that I wasn't really sure that I was going to like was these green W's, um, W, W, W. <laughs> I feel like that's, everyone pronounces that differently. Uh, at first I was like, I don't know if I like that. Couldn't we just use colors? You know, couldn't we just use green and like highlight the rogue green? And one thing I found that they're doing a good job of here is it's not just color. You can't rely on only color if people have color blindness. So it's use of color plus another visual indicator. In this instance, the W or the L, right? That's good. If it was just green and I was colorblind, you might not be able to tell that this was a win 
versus a loss. So let's go check out mobile web, which is, I actually find this extremely interesting that the mobile web design for ESPN is quite a bit different, um, especially the schedule page. It's very, very information dense. Um, I would argue a bit too information dense. So too information dense on schedule. I think that there's one thing that it's got going for it here, which is very easy scan, scan ability. It's scannable. Like I can look at that row of W's and really easy see, okay, we've run, we've won five in a row, right? It's very easy to, to see that. And I like that the dates are also easily shown as well too. Now, another con of this, I feel like, is that the homepage, there's like, what is this, what is this section right here doing? I don't understand what this is doing. I also don't understand why here, it's showing the first three games, which is fine, but it's not showing the next game. Like you would think when I land here, I would want to see who we're playing next as one of the most important things, right? So if you look at the mobile app too, which is really interesting, this is the home page on the mobile app and you can put your favorite teams. And it's interesting how then it does exactly what I'm talking about. Like this section is the team that we're playing next. That's what I care about. I open up the app. The first thing I want to see is, okay, here's the team that we're playing next. And... It's also really interesting that the mobile app goes with this kind of vertically stacked design, even on the schedule and scores page. So there's this duplication of, it shows the, you know, the home team or your favorite team multiple times versus on mobile web, it's more condensed single rows, which I think there's trade-offs to both ways. But this design looks really clean. Like overall, I think the design of the mobile app is pretty dang good. I also love, um, I love the uh, person personalization of the header with the team color. That's a really nice touch. Um, I mean, I know this is a negative. It's kind of like they, they have to do this, but ads, right? Like these these in-app ads, maybe there's a way to get rid of those I don't know of. Like you gotta pay, if you have ESPN Extra Plus or something that you can get rid of them. I'm not aware of it, but it is kind of frustrating. Uh, another thing too, this is just like a, a downside of apps in general. It's like, I feel like it's kind of slow to open. And I don't know if anyone else has noticed this, but there are some big advantages of mobile web, especially a really fast and optimized mobile website versus a mobile app in terms of how quickly that thing can can boot up. Um, especially if you embed the, you can do a bookmark and you can add it to your home screen on Android or iPhone. And then it's it basically looks and kind of feels like an app, um, which is underrated, right? Um, what else do I like about these? What else is good? What else is bad? I, I did say that the, this, um, stacked card design is kind of nice. Uh, another thing that this design does a really good job of is it makes use of color well. It uses color to denote importance. And we're gonna talk a lot more about this, but just a quick example is, I care who won. Like that's, you have to think about the, the UX of actually using this thing and the scannability. I care that Iowa State won one, two, three, four, five. So because of that, the winner is, you know, text white. <laughs> and the loser is text gray 500. I'm going to speak in tailwind throughout this so we can bridge that designer developer gap. So not only is it color, it kind of gives this illusion of like one is faded out because they've lost, which also plays well to the like, like <laughs> in video games, it's like they get faded when they lose, right? Um, so I do like that. I also like the side scrolling menu here. That's kind of nice. Um, and you know, this is kind of, 
this is kind of universal, this, these design principles. Like, this could work if it was a football match, if it was, um, you know, a bunch of different types of games or sports on ESPN. You can share a lot of those same design principles. Granted, some of the, the scoring is going to be different, but there's some good stuff happening right here. Uh, another thing that's interesting is, like, in terms of the importance of content, we're going to talk about this a bit more as well, but, like, there's not too much going on in terms of color selection and font sizes. So, right, the most important thing that we wanna drive our eye to here is these. This is happening today. Both of these are in white, right? Nobody has lost or won. So I don't, this isn't the important, most important content on the page. So it's gonna have a text gray 500, text gray 700, right? It's gonna be a less important thing. So they, do, they did a good job here of, of working with color. Now, I don't think we necessarily need to go too far into any of these, but it's interesting just to see how other, other sites design similar content. For example, this site, when the game is in progress, both of the scores are white so that you can see that that's the most important thing that's happening right now. The one interesting thing, I think, in comparison with this versus ESPN's design, I actually really like that the score is a larger font size. It puts more importance like, hey, as I'm scrolling through here, this is the thing that matters. Yeah, I can drill down and look at like specific halves or more information if I want, but this is the stuff that matters. And again, that same idea where this whole thing's faded and this one is the one that you focus on. Especially even like the name of the, the tournament is also just really kind of a, a lower gray color here. It's not that important, right? It's not what your eyes should focus on. So some, some pretty good stuff overall here that I was kind of researching when I wanted to start iterating on this thing. So that's, that's kind of what led me to get into Figma and actually start trying to make something. So now let's dive in and take a look at the first iteration of building out a more streamlined ESPN for, for lack of a better word. Um, so I'll go over this iterations page inside of Figma. And since some of y'all, you know, might have more Figma experience or less Figma experience, I'll try to just step back and introduce things that are helpful for me that may be obvious for some of the, you know, some of the Figma experts. So if you have specifics that you want to know more about or you have questions, please feel free to just drop them in the chat. Like, how did you do that thing? How did you use that shortcut? Um, all of those questions are totally, totally valid. The first thing I will say that I didn't know for a while that's helpful is when you're starting out and you make a new frame, use these templates. It's just, it's so much easier to start from these. I don't know why I would like draw my own frames on here. It's like, you can do that. Or you can just go to new frame and say, okay, I want the iPhone 14 Pro and it's gonna give you the right screen sizes, right? So that was where I started. And I started with this. Now, there's a couple things going on here. One, I liked including the logo. I think that that gives it the flair and the, the easily identifiable kind of at a glance for which team is yours. I'm able to scroll here and put that recognition between a logo and the actual text. So that makes it easy for me to look at. I also kept the green W because I'll actually show you, it's kind of interesting. I explored this, the green background, and it just, it looks, it just looks bad. I'm not gonna lie. It's just too much going on. There's, it's almost distracting how how much it stands out. So it's actually a, just a little bit simpler to just put this green W in here. And another thing that I liked here is just the difference between this being bold or regular actually makes a pretty big difference. So semi-bold here just seemed to look better. Now the first design tip I can give you in looking at this is that you might notice almost everything is topography. And the matter of fact is that if you nail topography and spacing, your design is gonna look 10 times better than you know, what you started with. Those are the biggest things that you wanna to try to master and get better at because 
it will just feel like everything is more cohesive and well put together. If you are limiting your topography and spacing choices and using a system, there's a reason it's called a design system. So for example, how many font sizes do you think I'm using on the page right here? You probably shouldn't have 10 different font sizes. It's gonna start to look a bit cluttered. So for example, in this row, this is a 16 point font. This is a 16 point font. This is also a 16 point font. The difference and how we can make these visually different is by the color. Now again, the same thing applies to color. You don't wanna have 10 different shades of gray, 50 shades of gray, right? You wanna have like three or four shades of gray. You don't wanna have uh, red, blue, green, orange, you know, 20 different strong colors on the page either. You wanna really try to limit your color palette to make it seem clean. This is how you get designs that just seem like they're easy to read, easy to parse, uh, and don't strain your brain when you're trying to understand what is happening. So this is black, it's, it's complete black, zero, zero, zero. This, I picked a medium gray. Now you'll notice over here on the right in Figma, you see this light accent six. What is happening here is I'm using a design system inside of Figma. Now this is using Vercel's colors, which are a scale from black to white and a scale of grays. You could use the actual colors of Tailwind if you wanted here. You could use an external system here. It doesn't really matter. The point is that this is constraining me down to a set of 10 colors, and I'm not even gonna use all 10 of these colors, right? So I've got you know, full black, I've got an accent six, which in Tailwind speak, this might be um, accents 600 or accents 700, right? I've got black again here, I've got accents six here. So these are the same color. I don't need to introduce a new color here, right? And then this border bottom, I really don't wanna put as much visual emphasis on this. So we're going with a, I think it's a accent two, right? And it's really interesting as you start to look at just the difference in what changing that color would be. So let's say I got in here and I changed this to, I, I think I see this mistake a lot with people uh, in design who are just beginning, or developers who are just starting out with design is they use too harsh of colors for borders. So like, look at the difference here. If I make this, I don't know, accent seven, it's just, it's pretty rough. Like I don't need that much emphasis to separate out these rows. Side note, but this is actually something that the iOS ecosystem does extremely well. When you build an iOS app or a native app and you use the components that they give you, you fall into this pit of success of good design by default when you use the list view items, right? They, this kind of gives me iOS vibes. It's using Inter here, which is basically San Francisco, which is Apple's native font. So it kind of feels like that same list view design where you have your, you know, your element on the left, you have your text and you have your other text that's aligned right. This is a pattern that you would see in a native iOS app, right? Okay, so I started here. Like I said, there's some good stuff happening here. If the games are in progress, or if the games have finished, we can put the scores. If they're coming up, we can put the times. So now let me walk you through some of the iterations I made as I looked at this and really thought about, okay, how can I make this better? So the first thing I explored was, do we need the full timestamp? I think a common developer to designer translation mistake is I'm just gonna basically put in the data the same way that I got it from the database. I'm not gonna do any sort of visual formatting or changes. And really, you can do a lot with dates. Now, granted, again, if this is a, um, a global application, you might need to think about how you're displaying those dates in the local light, in the local uh, time zone. If it is something that supports multi-languages, you might have to think about you know, different types of languages that might be left to right, right to left. Um, so you have to design with the constraints of your system. In this instance, you know, I can you know, just use JavaScript to convert this to the local time format. So I kind of like the shorter date or the shorter time, but I'm not sure if this did start at 7.30, if that's gonna look you know, out of alignment when I have to put that in there. That's kind of the pro 
of keeping the full timestamp out all the time is that it prevents some of this. Uh, it almost looks like it almost looks like a layout shift, even though it's not a layout shift, but it just doesn't look as streamlined. So I'm not entirely sure about that one just yet. The next thing I was exploring was how do I change between teams? So imagine I land on this app and I want to look at the stats or scores specifically for my team, which is Iowa State, but then I want to transition and click on any of these other teams. My first thought is that all of these would actually be links. They don't need any, I don't think they need any kind of visual indication of that. I think maybe if you hover, there could be indication, but you could click on North Carolina here, or maybe you click on this and we just use, you know, a native uh, select element to pull up a list of teams. Maybe if we wanted to get really extra, we could do some kind of type ahead that allows you to search, but I prefer to stick to native uh, HTML controls if possible. Also, this is the type of stuff that I think is a superpower of developers who think about design and designers who start thinking about develop developers because you have to consider the constraints of how you're actually building this thing. I'm not just going to go design this completely custom select only for my developer to say, actually, that's not very accessible. That's going to struggle on these devices. Can we just use the normal browser select? Especially if you try to like, it's funny because I actually tried um, a custom select on a different score site and it was using something custom. And if you don't use the native select, iOS just doesn't handle it very well unless you really put in the developer hours to do that. So I prefer to stick to that as kind of as much as possible. Okay, next thing I explored was, okay, obviously there isn't eight games in a season. So what happens when you have the entire schedule and how can I introduce the concept of the rankings inside of the conference, right? So granted these teams are wrong. This would be like people in the big 12, but this, this is an abstract thing. Uh, I did this like subtle fill here, this linear fill and type on top of an element here. And this is a little trick that I use quite a bit. So I just made a, a rectangle here. If you go to fill, and you click on the icon, you can change the drop down here whether you want it to be a solid color or a gradient. So I changed it to a linear gradient and I made one of them a solid color and one of them have some opacity, right? And that gives me this nice fade out effect. Then I was thinking, okay, we'll have some little element here that you can click and that would actually expand the whole row, maybe have a nice animation too. So I'm kind of liking where this is going. Um, I pulled out just this rankings bit to explore what the kind of conference rankings would look like because it's not gonna be individual scores. It's going to be, here's how many games they won in the conference, here's how many games they've won overall. And this introduces a new typographic style. And I did this on purpose because this is almost functioning like a table header. I actually preferred the all caps, one font size down, um, treatment here. So for example, this is size 14 and it is in all caps. Like just to, to show off kind of what this would look like, let's say that this was not all caps and let's do 16 as well here. It's okay. Like I don't hate it, but the O-N in between conf just looks a little off with that lowercase f. I actually just much prefer here that treatment kind of feels like that table header that you would kind of expect, right? So I went there and then I replaced that with that same gradient button drop down approach. I'm like, okay, I'm liking the direction we're going. But then I thought, am I using a gradient to actually add to the user experience? Or is this just pure visual flair? And this is like a good gut check as you're designing. And what I realized was, well, now I can't see the fourth team in the row here. So this is actually degrading the user experience because I was trying to make it just a little bit more flashy. So I was like, okay, what if we just did something like this? We'll put the button on the row. It's still super obvious that you're not showing all the rows. You click on the button to kind of expand or contract this. So I liked the direction here, but I wasn't sure if this treatment of doing this button with an SVG to kind of expand, is that clear enough? 
So I wanted to explore some options here. Maybe we need actual text on the screen. Maybe it shouldn't be a circle. Maybe it should be a, a square or a squircle, right? Or some kind of funky shape here. So I tried, <laughs> I tried a version with show all. I didn't really love that. It's like, it's fine, but it didn't add that much more than just using this. It actually seemed like it, it made the design more distracting. So that was like, okay, what about show? Still, I kind of felt like this still seems to be a bit more clear in terms of what I'm going for. So I decided, okay, let's just take that. Let's feel good about that. And let's kind of pause and move on to the next iteration. Take what we have here and try to figure out how we can extend this even further. All right. Let's take a look at the second iteration where I then felt pretty good about where I'd left off, but it was time to add in a bit more data. So I started here, and the next thing I wanted to think about is how can I, at a glance, understand what's the overall record, how we doing, what's the ranking, maybe what's the, even the potential national ranking. So I came up with this small little design. And I overall, it's okay. But I think this fell into the same thing I talked a little bit about earlier, which is mapping a database column essentially to a UI. Like this is screaming at me, record five and zero oh. conference ranking first, big 12, national rank. Like it really feels like it's screaming at me. It feels like this one-to-one -one mapping of database table. Is that direct labeling necessary? I don't think so. So you'll see in a second, I refactored to try to get rid of that because it didn't really necessarily feel like it needed to be there. Another little design change here that I made that I thought was really, really impactful is actually putting the titles here aligned with the dropdown, but the rows are indented a little bit. So you'll notice here, if I click on this, um, if I click on this element, Figma pro tip, if you hold option, you can see the actual pixel differences between all of your elements. Um, you can kind of expect it down to the actual pixel value. And this is extremely, extremely helpful for me because I want to get things kind of as pixel perfect as I can. So we're about, you know, 20 pixels from the left here and these titles are nine. Now that's already red flag because I'm off of my grid here. So this should probably be eight. Um, there's different grids you can use. Some people stick to like an eight point grid. So everything is kind of multiples of eight. It's like four, eight, 16, 32, or pieces in between there. The idea here is that if you stick to a grid, if you stick to a system, your designs will look more fluid because everything is kind of a multiple or uh, some division of that number. And that's why you have uh, an eight point grid or a 10 point grid. There's another Figma tip here, which is when you use the arrow keys to move something, you're moving them by one pixel. Now you can change the actual value here, but if you do a shift nudge, if you hold shift and you press left, right, you move it by in my case, I have it set up as 10 pixels. If you're on an eight point system, maybe you want to just use eight pixels. Also shout out to MDS and Shift Nudge course. MDS is a, MDS is a great designer. You should absolutely check him out. Um, but it's interesting how big of a difference this can make. For example, let's take a look at these row elements. I'll just uh, try to, let's do, let's do this one. Inside of this, we have these four rows. I'm gonna highlight all four of these rows, and this is another Figma concept uh, we can introduce and talk a little bit about here, which is auto layout. I Auto layout was something that I struggled with a little bit at first because I was used to just kind of winging pieces around together in Figma, but you can kind of think of auto layout like Flexbox. That's the mental model that it helps me with, and it also helps when I'm actually trying to translate this back to code. So for instance, these rows, each row is in an auto layout. And this top one, you can kind of think of these elements on the left-hand side here as one div, and then the elements on the right-hand side as another div. And there's justify content space between 
to make this fill the auto width. So if you look at our auto layout panel here right below my face, you'll notice that the spacing in between the items is auto. We have 20 pixels of horizontal padding and we have 12 pixels of vertical padding. So just to make this super clear, the difference between indenting this, let's say I kind of remove this down to 10 pixels, right? So now this logo is more aligned with the heading of the rest of the page. There's a couple things that I didn't really like about this. One, we probably need more margin or padding around the entirety of the container because it's really close to the side here. Like it's, there's, there's a lot going on. Second, it, it makes it kind of hard to get the distinction here between the header and the content between. So just comparing the difference between that and this, I prefer the version where the rows are indented just a little bit. They have a little bit more padding on the left-hand side. So let's go back to that. Uh, another thing that's cool here is if you look at, for example, this content here. Now, you might notice on the right here, you have your, your text properties, right? And if this is set at a fixed size, so example, Kansas State here, and I'm going and I'm adding in new content, and let's say I, say I do like Kansas State Wildcats, and it breaks down to a new line. Well, this is actually bad because I wanted it to actually to fit the size of the text that I'm writing in and then kind of automatically adjust my layout here. So instead I can use this arrow right here, which is auto width, which is gonna make that actually hug the contents of the text inside the container. So that's another little thing that I used here to make this layout just a little bit easier to work with as I was kind of copy pasting and adding new items here. And the nice thing about it is it really starts to turn into React components inside of Figma when you use auto layout and you construct auto layouts of layouts, if that makes sense. So for example here, right, if you look at my uh, layers on the left-hand side, I have four rows inside of a, essentially a container that is also auto layout. And I don't have anything set up in terms of um, you know, I don't have any padding on here. I don't have any space between the icon or the items. I could if I wanted to, but in this instance, I don't need that. But it's cool because then it's very easy to say, okay, actually I wanna just duplicate this row and I don't have to like manually drop anything down or move things around. It's just, it all kind of falls into the system. So I would recommend trying to use auto layout and trying to work with it as you can. Another nice little touch that I made here is my thought was, okay, I open up the page, I wanna see the next game. How can I elevate that to pull it out of the schedule? And rather than showing these kind of, you know, more, I guess, you know, UTC-esque dates or these more explicit like 11 slash 27, could we do this in a more human readable format? The game's tomorrow at 9 p.m. Uh, or the game is today at 9 p.m. And maybe we want to even explore putting the time zone on there, or maybe it should just automatically figure out the time zone given where the user is kind of viewing the page from. So I like, I like the direction there. I wasn't totally sold on this being it's in an entire section broken out, but I was like, okay, we can, we can work with this. We can iterate on this. So next I wanted to explore, did I have too much padding in between here? So I tried to kind of pull this up and make it a little bit more scrunched together. And the general rule of thumb that I've learned from listening to designers that are much better than myself is that you can kind of almost never have too much space. It's easier to start with more white space and then move things down versus the other way around where things feel crammed and you don't entirely know why. Even the difference here between looking at you know, all of these rows, if I put this down to, to 10 here, and let's say I did the same for all these. So I'm removing a lot of that visual spacing. Just compare the difference between this and this. I'm really using white space to my advantage to add that little bit of spacing on the left, to put some space here in between these sections. So use space. The next thing I was exploring 
was... Actually, I'm not sure the difference between these two. <laughs> it's, it's like one of those games where you have to spot the differences. They look pretty similar, but here's where things start to get a little different. And this ties things back to what I mentioned up top. How do I take this and put it into something that's a bit more human readable? It isn't like a database table. I want to know that they're 5-0. and oh. I want to know that they're first in the Big 12. Well, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that 5-0 and oh means that's your record. I think people who are viewing the app are able to deduce that. We don't need to necessarily spell it out with record, right? So the ESPN site had something like this, and I actually really liked this. So I kind of pulled inspiration from the ESPN site for this to just do 5-0, and oh, um, a bullet here to separate in between them, and first in the Big 12. And another little thing here that I changed that I wasn't sure if I was going to like it or not, but it was worth kind of visually exploring is making just the team name bold, but then making the mascot or the, you know, whatever the, the team's, um, yeah, mascot is, is non-bold here. And it, it looks okay. I'm not sure if I love it yet, but it was something to kind of explore. So I liked the direction we were headed in here. I feel like this makes it feel like a proper header, a proper H1 for the page. Um, the last thing that I was exploring before we can actually start talking about some code is the schedule. So we have next broken out into its own section here. What if this was a logical element that flowed with the rest of the schedule? So what I did was I kind of pulled this together and I explored two different treatments. One that was also bold or semi-bold in this instance and not uppercase. And another that went with the one font size down. So it's 14, uh, 14 point here. And it was a accent six. And kind of comparing them side to side, it felt to me, <coughs> excuse me, it felt to me like the next and full that better resembled the other headings just seemed to flow a bit better than taking that kind of table column heading design that we had used in um, the, the, you know, this part right here. So I think this is, this is the winner for me in terms of kind of simplifying things down to just the schedule, the next game, trying to make just the things that we care about. I'm curious if anyone in the chat has feedback or suggestions on ways that they would tweak or improve this design and just see if there's anything more we could kind of explore here. Another thing that's important to mention too is I started with mobile. And I started with mobile because it's much easier to design under the mobile constraint and have it work well on mobile web before you actually expand it out and look at desktop. So I basically just pulled this into desktop and I hadn't really done, <laughs> I haven't really done much with it at all because I don't really know what additional information I kind of want to bring in and enhance the experience now that I have all of this extra screen real estate. Maybe I want to show other scores from the league in real time on the right side. And something I couldn't as easily do with the constraint of the mobile design, right? So it gives you that opportunity. Another thing, uh, going back to topography at the start that you'll notice I did was I only used two font weights. Got the entirety of all of these designs. I have regular, I believe it's called with, with, um, with Inter, which is kind of a, a medium weight. It's just one less than medium here. I'd say this is probably more aligned with like a 400 uh, point in terms of your, you know, your CSS. And then I have bold, but it's not actually full bold. It is a semi-bold. And I think, let me get this in here. Yeah, semi-bold. And it's subtle, but it makes a big difference. Even if I compare, um, let's say I just take these two, let's drop these two bold instead of semi-bold. It's just, I don't know. It's just a little much for me. It's, you could even go to black, right? And now it's like, okay, that's just, that's a lot. I don't think we need, I don't think we need that much. There was a suggestion here, uh, maybe align the logos with the F or full and the N of next. So I think what they're suggesting here is like, one, we could potentially do something like this. Or two, 
we could go back to these rows and change the um, horizontal padding here to be more like this. And I think my take here is, I don't know, I still really like having the extra padding on the side. I think this could go, I think this is kind of the designer's uh, designer's choice here, designer's taste. I don't think there's necessarily a right or wrong way. I kind of prefer this extra space here, but I could also see, whoops, I could also see somebody really liking the approach here. Um, it sounds like, yeah, it sounds like, yeah. It, sometimes you can't really tell until you pull them up side by side, but I appreciate the, the suggestions. Um, could you bring back the drop down? There's a, uh, a previous chat in here. Could you bring back the drop down and have the name logo um, data in the drop down card? That is interesting. You know, a world where, let's say I kind of pulled this over here. Another Figma tip if you hold option, you can easily kind of clone and duplicate an entire element. And then as you move things around, it kind of snaps to a grid. So I want to have the same spacing here. So it's 47 pixels apart, just a random number, but same spacing, I drop it. And now I have this new frame that copied everything over. So the suggestion here was like, can all of this be inside of a single dropdown? Does it need to have a title and additional data and then have the dropdown below? Cause this is like, you know, kind of duplicated here. So maybe what we want to explore is, let me just take this. Oh, I actually had to do two separate elements here <laughs> to move the font size of this down to get it exactly how I liked it. So I'll just take this. I can do command option G, which is gonna make this a new frame and kind of group these elements together. Um, so I'll take this. We can, this is already a frame. So let me just move this up and kind of snap to the grid. Maybe we don't wanna even use this since it's, you know, it's duplicated in here. So we could take this. Let's make this all semi-bold. And then we can take inside of this frame, we'll take the rectangle and we'll make it a bit bigger, maybe, maybe 70 pixels. And we could put this inside of here, maybe like this. So now if I scroll over here, I highlight this element and I hold option, we can see that there's one pixel of difference between these two. So maybe I want, you know, thinking in four point grid, one, two, three, four, add a little bit of spacing here. That looks okay. I don't mind that too much. Now, what we probably want to do is make sure that this, we've got 12 pixels between it and the top of the element. We probably want 12 pixels between this and the bottom of the element. So let's just move this. Now we've got 12 here and we've got 12 here. So this is looking okay. This, we probably want this centered. I think that probably makes the most sense. And I, it's a toss up, I guess, whether this should be centered or not. I actually don't, you know, I don't mind that. That is kind of nice. Um, although now seeing this, the centering looks, it kind of makes it feel out of balance. Um, because my eyes are reading this left to right. So now they're jumping up and down, trying to parse and process the logo and then process the text. So let's, let's actually put this back. Um, you know, I don't, I don't mind that. Let's take this whole thing, kind of put this back up at the top. Again, we can do our little trick here of just taking this frame, we're 10 pixels here. 10 pixels here from this top element. Really all I'm doing with this red element at the top, by the way, is I'm trying to simulate the Safari theme color. And I was thinking to give it a little bit of that personalization that I liked from the ESPN site was to use the team's color to actually pull in that information. So now I could kind of go in here and just highlight all this stuff and you know hold shift and use the arrow keys and kind of pull it up a little bit. Now. It almost looks maybe a little too, maybe we want 10 instead of 20 up at the top. Maybe even a little more. Yeah, I mean, this is an interesting iteration. I don't know if I prefer it. I actually kind of like having the explicit header here, but it is interesting. And this is the type of 
playgrounding that you can do to really figure out the design that works best for, for you. So let's, let's call it good with this one and actually start moving into how we can translate this into some code. So you've got your design, you feel decent about it, but when do you actually make the transition from working in Figma to getting into the code? I think this is one of the things that I've found confusing before. I think I've seen other designer developers struggle with, should I build out an entire prototype in Figma? Should I just go straight to the code earlier and start componentizing things or spending less time in my editor or in my designer? The balance that I've found that I like is I try to get things to a point in Figma where I feel good about the overall aesthetic, but I'm not thinking too much about this is how I would pull this into a component or this is how the data would flow in. I'm not thinking about, okay, I need to prototype out this animation. For me personally, it's easier at this point to actually stop and now let's open up the editor and start moving things around. So next up, let's actually take this design and start moving things into code. Uh, it's easier to change things in Figma than in code, yeah. Absolutely, see this is the thing that's really important for me is it's less expensive time-wise for me to make mistakes, try things out and experiment while I'm in this playground versus codifying it quite literally into something. So for example, this idea of like, well, what if this was all part of the dropdown? This was a super cheap, time thing for me to do here to explore these two iterations. If I had already built this thing into this select component and I had spent all this time building the design, maybe I wouldn't even explore that. Maybe I wouldn't even experiment and see how these different things work. So that's when you might realize, okay, things are still too early. I still need to be in Figma in my design tool of choice, kind of spiking out exactly how I want this to work. Now let's talk about code. Uh, in another screen here, what I've done is ran create next app. I made a brand new Next.js application. I've installed Tailwind. I've put a single image on the page. That's basically all I've done inside of this application. It's kind of just a hello world app and you can see it running over here on the right. Now, an interesting thing to note actually to talk about is part of the reason why I decided to actually build this into a real application was because I found out that you can reverse engineer the ESPN APIs. Uh, I don't take any credit for this. Somebody else uh, documented it on GitHub when I was actually uh, exploring this. But for example, check out this. Site.espn. or site.api.espn.com slash sports basketball, men's college basketball, teams slash ID. And by the way, I'm using this JSON viewer Chrome extension here that makes it a little bit easier to visualize what I'm looking at. But I looked at this and I realized, oh wow. So not only can I build a design that looks like this, I can actually populate it with real data and turn this into a real application. And again, kind of going back to when do I eject from Figma and into actual designs, it's probably not worth it for me to start building out this in code and actually manually writing NCANT, manually writing Milwaukee, manually going and pulling all of these logos. It worked well enough while I was still in the validation stage, but I'm, when I'm actually codifying this, I want this to be pulled from real data. I don't want it to be fake data. And you'll see as we walk through this kind of how that actually, um, how that actually plays out. I see there's a question like, can we actually use these APIs? That's a good question. I saw in the chat, some people said, you know, be respectful about rate limits and don't hit these. So what I'm gonna pl plan on doing is just build a static site with this. So it would only ever actually hit these APIs when I'm running a build. So very low actual usage of these. I am curious the decision, maybe if there's some people on the ESPN team who are <laughs> watching the stream, why these are, you know, public in the way that they are. Maybe they all have, uh, <laughs> maybe they all have, uh, like some master plan for people to rebuild the ESPN site using these, or maybe it's just easier. I don't know, but I, it is interesting that there's these and a bunch of other APIs here that I found that you can kind of just easily inspect. 
The main thing here is that I have real data, real REST APIs, real JSON that I can pull from to actually populate what we're seeing on the screen. And notice this URL structure here too. If I do team 65 instead of 66, this is Grinnell. So this is a completely different team here. So I'm able to actually pull dynamic data back uh, for, for the site that I'm trying to build. Another thing here is inside of Figma, if you hit the play button, you can open up this prototype view. And since I'm using the iPhone frame size, it actually displays it kind of like an iPhone. You can even see the Safari bump at the top. So we're gonna use this as kind of our reference check as we compare against what the design should look like versus what things actually look like in the code. And to start, what we're gonna do is actually just build out something completely static, um, completely using kind of fake data. And then we can pull from a real API and try to build um, something with, you know, for example, something like this API. So let me reset this over here. And um, let me just quickly talk again about how this is set up. So there's a couple changes that we've made. One, I'm using the app directory, which is in beta. Um, so if you haven't seen this before, basically I have a layout file that wraps my entire application. And I have an HTML tag that has some CSS classes. I have a body tag. And then I have a page. This page is the index route. So localhost 3000, that is this page. And on this page, it just returns a component. And that's the image that I'm seeing here using the Next.js image component. And this is similar to pages slash index in the uh, pages directory, which you can also use. But for the sake of this demo, I wanted to just use the app directory. And then inside of the root layout, I'm including some global styles. This is kind of just the boilerplate Tailwind setup. So I'm not doing anything custom with Tailwind. I just have the, the basic setup to allow me to use the utility classes. Now, also helpful to mention, if you don't, like if you're, maybe if you're more on the design side and you're not as much on the developer side, you can also do play.tailwindcss.com and get real Tailwind in the browser first, third, like this. So this is a real online IDE. I can go in here and, you know, change whatever I want, hello, stream, and it updates automatically. So, you know, you can also validate your ideas here very easily if you want before you actually pull this into your editor. Here's the reason why I decided to go straight to the editor. What happens when I wanna start componentizing things? This is where the React model shines, especially when I'm dealing with dynamic data like images. I don't wanna necessarily have to go copy paste all the different you know, lines here as I'm dealing with the different teams. It'd be great to just extract that out into a row component and actually fetch dynamic data and use it. So I was like, eh, this is okay. I don't necessarily mind this, but let's just go straight into the editor. Um, so what I did is I configured my Next.js application to be able to optimize images from a remote location. So when I was inspecting this API, I noticed that you can get back all of the logos and ESPN has its own CDN here. So inside of my next config, I'm saying, hey, here are the uh, allow list of URLs that you're able to optimize images from. And here's the formats that I wanna use. So now in my page, if I go back over here, you'll see that the Next.js server is saying, okay, this URL, this is valid. We can optimize an image from here and we wanna display it with a width and height of 100. So if I inspect this here and I pull up the dev tools, we see the image element, we see that it uses this underscore next slash image URL, which is actually optimizing the image and it includes some other attributes to help it load fast. Okay, so we have this. Let's actually start turning this into code. So the first thing we're gonna do, I think the, the smallest molecule to try to attack would be the actual row. So let's do that. Um, let's, let's say we will take this image, we'll just cut this. Let's start with a div. And uh, I have Emmet installed, so I can do uh, abbreviations here and kind of simplify a few things. So if I do div dot margin x4, and I hit tab, it allows me just to quickly add those as class names. 
So for example, then if I paste this image in here, you'll see on the right, my browser reloads and I get, I'll just zoom in a little bit for now so you can see this. Um, I get that margin on X here. So if we go back to our design, we have a logo, we have some text, we have that kind of space between that we talked about it, we think in the Flexbox model, and then we have some other text on the right side. So let's let's do that. We'll start with uh, we'll start with Iowa State. So if we imagine this entire div as being a uh, flex, then what we want to do is have this element. We'll just cut this. We're going to do another div inside of here, and we'll do this as flex as well. We have the image, and we have some paragraph here. Let's do uh, font bold and we'll do margin left of two. Another nice thing about Tailwind is I was already starting to think in a design system when I was working in Figma. A lot of those same concepts apply now that I'm moving into the code phase. Margin left two actually converts into a system of eight pixels, right? So we're again, we're on that grid system. If I stick with margin left two, three, four, eight, I'm sticking on that system. So we have Iowa State Cyclones here. Um, we don't need this to be uh, 100. We could, do, uh, we could do 20 here. If I do Command D, I can select multiple. So we'll do 20. And we have our, our icon here, Iowa State Cyclones. And yeah, it looks okay. So now we want to do a, another div. Let's flex. We want to have a paragraph of text gray. Let's do 700. Yeah, we'll do 700. And oh, what happened there? Looks like Emmett was not happy, but that's fine. Class name, text gray 700. This was the score, for example. So we could do... 86 to 24, 25, 24. Uh, and then we also had another paragraph. This was font bold. Uh, it was also text green, maybe 700. We'll do that in a W. And let's do margin left two again. And we'll do... We actually want all of this text to be to be right aligned. So we'll do text right um, because we want this to all kind of be on that right side axis. So that looks, yeah, I think that seems right. Um, on this outside div, we want to do a border on the bottom. One pixel is fine. And then we'll do a border gray. Uh, let's do 200. Let's save. Okay, so we're starting to make some progress here. This is looking a bit more real. Um, we want these two, these two divs, this one and this one, to actually have that uh, content between them. So let's do um, justify between, justify content space between. And then we need a little bit of margin here. So we'll do... Um, well, actually, we want padding because we still want that border to run all the way across the bottom. So we'll do like padding X two, maybe. That looks okay. And then we need some Y, well, maybe do a little more. Padding X three, padding Y two. Now we're talking. Now we are talking. That's looking a little bit better. Uh, I might need to move my, my, uh, my image here so that you can see the whole thing. Let me actually just go add inside the layout. I'll do a margin top of 12. Or maybe I could just like center this or something. There we go. Margin top 80. <laughs> so now you can see the entire row that I'm working with. Uh, so that's not cut out behind my head here. I see a couple questions. Do you feel the legibility of your code can be uh, hampered by having multiple class names in one file. So I actually feel kind of the opposite. I prefer having this explicit relationship between my styles and my HTML markup. 
yes, you can, if you really want, still abstract this out into custom class names. But the cool thing about this, and you'll see, is while right now this is looking, you know, kind of like a lot, you actually can simplify this by just using the React component model. Really everything that I'm looking at here is a row. So why don't I just take this whole thing and start breaking this out into a component, right? So let's just do a function row. And then when I'm actually exporting my page, what I wanna do is have multiple rows. Whoops. And I could do an actual wrapping element around this, or I can do a fragment, a React fragment. Let's do a fragment for now. And this is really powerful because now every change that we make to the source markup, let's say that we, you know, maybe we instead wanted to have a bunch more padding in the Y here. Now it's kind of similar to where we've componentized this in Figma, but it's actually in my code, right? This is a powerful, powerful model to help you iterate really, really quickly and kind of validate what you're wanting to do. Uh, I see a, another question here. Well, we got some Cyclones fans in the chat. I don't have a mouse that has horizontal scroll, so I have to manually scroll. Oh, text wrap. Yeah, text wrap is, is helpful to have on here. Um, others are feeling the same about Tailwind. Yeah, I think Tailwind for me, at first I looked at this and I immediately thought, Absolutely no. Like there was no way that I wanted to use this. It seemed like, it seemed disgusting. It seemed like, it seemed like a terrible idea until I actually started to build with it. And it really grew on me. Another reason it really grew on me, two things. One is I can open up any Tailwind code base and immediately know what the heck is going on. I don't have that luxury when I'm dealing with someone's custom you know, CSS and JS or SAS setup or some kind of specific thing set up just for their repository. Now, again, I understand it all compiles down to just normal CSS. I understand the, the argument of like wanting to learn just vanilla CSS. But for me, it's not that big of a difference between thinking in flex, which is display flex or justify, where was that again? Uh, justify between, which is like justify content space between, especially when you can hover over it and get that IntelliSense inside your editor that tells you the underlying class names. So it's really grown me a lot. Um, and as I scale to, you know, hundreds of components, thousands of components, the amount of CSS I need to load for the page remains the same if I stick to the same set of class names that Tailwind gives me because they are utility classes. This isn't a new idea. There's been plenty of solutions that have done this for a long time but it really, really shines if you're really trying to be critical of performance in a large scale application versus every single time to find your own artisanal CSS class name with its own unique styles. So we've got our rows. Um, overall, this is looking okay. I feel like there needs to be a bit more, a bit more padding on the X and I think more margin left here, yeah, now we're talking. That looks a little bit better. Another thing, I uh, natively typed font bold here because that's just kind of what I'm used to, but actually I was using semi bold inside of Figma. So I'll just command D and find all instances where I did font bold and change this to font semi bold. That's, that's looking much better. That's, that is making my brain feel good inside. Let me just, uh, remove some of this down here and make it, oh no, that's not what I want. Okay, um, so this is looking, that's looking pretty good. What happens if I have some dynamic data? Let's actually take advantage of this being a real, <laughs> yeah, this team really got beat bad. That was quite, quite the loss here. Um, Let's actually take advantage of React here and start abstracting this out. So what do we have? We have a um, we have an image, we have a name, we have the score, and we have whether they won or not. So I can start taking these hard-coded static elements here. This is the name. I can kind of move this to an element here. This is the name. We have the score, 86 to 24, which is, again, yeah, quite... <laughs> quite the beating there. Uh, I really hope that that isn't an actual score. 
uh, put the score on here. We have whether they won or lost, which we probably want to conditionally show this entire element. And then we also have the image. So let's take image and we'll drop image in here. And okay, so for win and loss, if it's a win, we want the green W. If it is the loss, we want red. So what we can do is we can actually just cut this element and let's do some condition in here. If, well, Tailwind's trying to help me out, right? If win, do this, else do this. Um, so for the loss case, we want an L and we want red 700. Again, by using Tailwind, we stick to a system. Red at 700 is gonna be the, you know, the different hue, but the same scale of color. Uh, we also got TypeScript being like, hey, what are you doing? So let's add some types here. Image string, name string, score is actually also a string. Win is a Boolean. Uh, we got a row, image, Iowa State, score, and let's say win. And now we can kind of get rid of these other hard-coded rows. And let's say that, you know, maybe some of these didn't, didn't win. And this one is uh, the Iowa Hawkeyes. Um, and this was, you know, 65 to 64, something like that. Now we have some real components, right? This component has been abstracted out into this reusable row. It's got conditional logic. I didn't have to kind of fiddle with any sort of prototyping um, or variance inside of Figma to do this. I just went straight to the code, right? It's time it's time to code. It's time to pull out the code and just actually build these conditions. And again, I can still just make these reusable rows here. Now I'm getting a TypeScript error because it's like, hey, by the way, these don't have win. Win is Boolean. So we can make win optional. If you don't specify win, it's a, uh, you know, it's a, a falsy value. And we'll do the, we'll give it the L basically. Um, so this is looking okay. Um, T-I-A-L, today I learned that a prop name by itself defaults to prop name equals true. Yeah, absolutely. There's actually some people who feel very strongly about this. I, uh, I've i learned <laughs> in, my, in my age that they really want you to use just the attribute name and not attribute name equals true. I personally don't care. I mean, either one is fine. Uh, it doesn't really matter that much. But yeah, you'll you'll find a lot of people who believe very strongly in a specific set of ESLint rules, essentially. So whatever works best for you, I would say, is, is what you should do. Could you make the type of win as true or false, um, as false as never needed? That's interesting. Actually, you know, honestly, I'm learning TypeScript more and more as I go every day. I didn't know that was a thing. Type of true. Oh, it still has to be optional because it's not included. But it's basically saying that you can never do this. Wow. Wow. Today I learned. <laughs> Today I learned. That's wild. That's pretty cool. This is why we stream live so that I can learn things from all the amazing people who are here in the chat. So thank you for teaching me something new. Um. <laughs> see somebody else. Somebody else was as shocked as me. Um, we've got some, some of the TypeScript fans in here. Yeah. TypeScript is great. I'm learning something new every day. Let's, uh, let's try to actually back this with some real data. I feel like the row elements are looking, they're looking okay. We could actually, we could try to build this entire entire schedule component if we wanted. And to do that, we're going to need to actually look at some data. So let's see. In the readme, I had pulled a few of these, a few of these APIs here. I'm actually not sure which one is the right one here. We're going to have to do a little bit of digging as we figure this out. This one was like teams slash ID slash schedule. I think this is the one that we're looking for. I see the, uh, IUPUI Jaguars at Iowa State. Um, this is a massive JSON object. So I think 
this is actually what we're looking for. So let's take this and um, we'll just the last third. Let's let's try to get some real data in here. So in this instance, this is a server component by default in the app directory, which means that we can mark it as async, make this an async component, and then fetch data, right? So let's do const data equals await fetch. And we have this API that we're fetching from. Now we're gonna get back some JSON and I actually should pull this up again on the right side, just so I can kind of look at the schedule or not the schedule, but the, the structure of the keys in this element. I'm hoping that Copilot might help me out a little bit here, but basically it looks like we have this events key, it's an array. There's different events on the schedule inside of here. Um, we have the name, the date, who is actually playing competitions, links. Okay. We also have a short name. So what we could try, I think one of the things I'm gonna be looking for here is actually being able to dynamically pull the logos for each team. What I don't know is whether we're gonna to have to get that directly from this API, if we're gonna to have to stitch it together with a different API, right? Like competitions, this is giving it an ID for a specific event, right? Oh, here we go. We have competitors. And of the competitors, I see Iowa State with an ID of 66, which is what I know to be the correct object for that team. And I see logos as well in here too. So I think what we want, let me, let's try, let's try to co-pilot this out. I'll try to use my words to, to mark what I want this is. So for all of the events on the schedule, we want to uh, iterate over the competitors and get the name and logo. Let's start with that. I think that makes sense. <laughs> we also want to get the score of the winner. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, sure, Copilot. Like, do whatever you want. I don't care. All right. Const events, JSON events.map. Competitors, team display name, logos at the first indice, href, score, winner. Is this, is that syntactically correct? I don't think it is. I think we're missing a closing bracket. That's not bad though. That's not bad. So let's make this a little bit more clear. This is data. Well, I, I, call, I called the first one data. Data dot data. No, no. This is, we'll say this is uh, the response. Response dot JSON. So we make a fetch and, ah, that's not what I want. We make a fetch, we get this data back, we get the JSON, we get the data. Data dot events dot map over the event. Man, typing this thing would be a nightmare. Um, do you think that, do you think it'll figure it out? No, maybe. I was hoping, I, I don't really want to do it, but infer parameter types from usage. Uh, sure. That doesn't, that doesn't seem right, right? Is that right? I don't know. We're going to find out. Okay, so we have some competitions event competitions at zero, we get the competitors, we map over those competitors, <laughs> we get the team, so this is looking correct, team, display name, logo, score, uh, winner is a Boolean, so that's good. Where's the score? Score. 
mm, display value. Well, that's kind of weird. It's the display value of one of the teams and not... Yeah, maybe we keep it as a... Maybe we keep it as a number instead of turning it into a string. I don't really know. I don't really know. But let's let's roll with this. We can delete our comment. This is decent. So what I want to do is now I have this array of events. I want to take this row and I'm going to go in here and we're going to do events.map and our row. So we have uh, event dot, was it logo? Is that right? Event dot logo, um, event dot name. That's also right. Copilot's helping me out here. Score, I don't think, I don't think this is accurate because I need to combine the two scores from the two different teams. But when, I also don't think this is accurate because one of them is going to be a true, one of them is going to be loss, right? <laughs> but let's see, let's see what we're working with here. I also want to maybe infer, infer parameter types from usage. Uh, sure. Do I need this? I don't know if I need the fragment anymore. Actually, I probably still need the fragment. So let's put that back. doesn't really matter because I'm going to be, whoops. I'm going to be adding the headings as well too. So we can just turn this into an actual div element. And I will get the types here again as well. Am I missing, a, I think I might be missing a semicolon. Closing parenthesis. Okay. So that is syntactically correct. It's making my editor happy. Uh, can't read properties undefined of logo. Okay. So let's work backwards from here. For an event, uh, we, well, we, we looped over the events. Actually, what I could do just to, just to make sure I'm not, you know, going down the completely wrong path here. Let's just log out to make sure that I actually have the data that I'm actually expecting that I'm going to have here. So let's hit save. Um, yes, I do have the data that I think that I actually have. Okay, cool. Data.events. Are there, are there events? Hmm. Interesting. Why does that look different? I would have expected to see here, not ID, date, time, short name. I would have expected to see the events key, but this is looking completely different. Uh, Next.js noob here, question, why are you fetching data inside the component instead of using get static props? Uh, the question here is why am I able to do this? Shouldn't I be using get static props? Inside of the new app directory, which is in beta, um, which you can check out in Next.js 13, you can actually just fetch data directly in components. You don't need to use get static props or get server side props. Um, you define how you want things to be cached on the actual fetch themselves or at the uh, essential, essentially the route level. So I'm, I'm skipping ahead a little bit in terms of the Next.js complexity, but I think if you started here, this is actually a more intuitive mental model. So for people who are just dropping in here for the first time. Also, you could use transform tools, JSON to TypeScript and paste the JSON there to receive a type. <laughs> That's wild. Uh, transform tools uses uh, Next.js and Vercel. So I have used this before. It's a pretty cool system. We can kind of keep doing it on hard mode, I guess. I think the interesting thing for me is why... Oh, wow. <laughs> you know how I was confused? Well, I just didn't scroll enough. So if I scroll up, I see the entire thing here, which is still what I'm expecting. Um, Timestamp, status, season, team, and then events. So that is actually looking how I would expect. So everything's good there. So we have our events... Let's log out 
the competitor and see how this is looking. So we have ID of 66, this is Iowa State, we have the team, we have the score, we have the leaders, we have record, curated rank, another team. So we might need to almost store this data as like a tuple basically, which, because um, you're having a, a set of, a set of two, you have the winner, and you have the loser for each event in the array, right? Um, because what we don't really want to do is just build up a bunch of these because for each game, there's actually multiple competitors, right? So what I think what we want is like, you know, honestly, a... Um, a reduce method could work a little bit better here than map, like two maps, but it probably doesn't matter that much. Um, so let's see. Let's, let's take this out of here. We have our two competitors, right? And now we want to actually return something a bit different. So what we want to do, we don't want to return the competitors. We want to do the comparison here. Um, this is, I think, where we want to have essentially like the, well, I guess we're only going to show one logo, right? We don't, maybe we don't even need a, like a tuple format because we can kind of um, destructure it down. Like I think the format we're actually looking for here is similar to this, but you're gonna determine who the winner is. And it's like, this should almost be as like home team and away team. Or there's there's always gonna be two competitors in this array probably. Um, I mean, I would assume, I don't know. I don't know a game where you're having uh, multiple competitors here. So we could actually, um, maybe this is where you, you, know, you blindly accept Copilot too far and it actually sends you down the wrong path, right? Maybe what we could do instead is say like, I actually don't know if they're always structured as home team or away team or winning team, losing team, first or second. But yeah, you could like break that out like this. And then like this is going to be one team. And this is going to be another team. You could break them out like this. Can Like only if and only if you knew that... The first one in the array was the winner. The first one in the array was the loser. It's probably fine. I think we can probably keep it just like this. So for now, what we want to do, or maybe we want to sort this by who the winner is. Um, what we want to do is take one of these competitors. And let's just say, you know, this is going to be hacky code, but we'll roll, we'll, we'll roll with it. Um, the winner is the competitor or competitor.winner is true. Um, and then you could also do like the inverse of this, right? This is where I'm starting to feel like we need a, a reduce because it's starting to get a little weird, but the inverse lookup, which is the opposite of this, you would have the other one in the array, but if it's the winner, that's who you're gonna wanna pick here. So, what we could do too is we could determine that, I'm just kind of thinking out loud as I work through the different options here basically. Another thing that we could do is given that I know that my team or the team that I'm looking at on this page is Iowa State, which has the ID of 66, really what we're showing here, we're showing the win for Iowa State. So this is basically did uh, like, did, um, favorite team per se did favorite team were they a winner or were they a loser the score is i guess we probably want to display this as like home team versus losing team so this is almost something like uh some kind of string template here where it's like uh maybe other team <laughs> other team score 
uh, favorite team score with no space in here. Like that's kind of the data format, I guess, that we're looking for. Logo, in this instance, we're always using the other team's logo, right? Other team dot logo. And the name, we're also always showing the other team's name, right? Because we're viewing the schedule for the current team. So maybe we'll just do it like this. I'm actually curious to see if this works. Sometimes blindly accepting uh, <laughs> Copilot is fun because then you can always refactor it to better code later. So we have the winner and we have the other team. Now this isn't totally right. I guess what we want to do is, what you'd want to do is find competitor where ID is equal to, instead of other team, we want favorite team. And we want to find our, our lookup here is like competitor dot to where we got here, ID. Uh, competitor dot team dot ID. I think that's right. Oh no, it looks like it's just ID. No? Competitors. Yeah, it's just ID. Question, hey, hey, what are we building? We just got here. Great question. We are going from Figma to Tailwind to our Next.js application. So at the beginning of this stream, we walked through actually how we built out this kind of ESPN clone. And then what we're doing right now is actually turning that into some real components on the screen that's backed by dynamic data using Tailwind classes. So what I'm doing right now is I'm kind of working backwards from this uh, public but not documented ESPN API to figure out kind of what I want this to look like. Um, and yeah, that's kind of where we're at right now. So this is competitor.id equals 66. And this, we're just gonna do the inverse case here for simplicity. This is the other team. Mm -mm 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 -mm. What's the error here? Other team is possibly undefined. No, it's not. This will always work. What could go wrong? TypeScript, don't yell at me. <laughs> the, uh, the guy coding on an iPad has arrived. When will you leave your new website project open source on GitHub? I am working on that soon. Making progress slowly but surely. I am getting there slowly, slowly but surely. Uh, let's see what we're working with here. Um, maybe just to kind of reset this back to a good state, what I can do is just kind of comment this out here um, just so people can kind of see what it's looking like for who, those who are just turning in. I'll just add back in this data. Um, yeah. So basically, this is where we're at right now. We have this row. It is componentized into a React component. It's got a, an image. It's got a name. It's got a score. It's got a win. It looks pretty similar to our Figma design, but it's actually using Tailwind. And what I'm trying to do is pull this dynamic schedule from this undocumented ESPN API. So let's see what we're working with here now. Um, we have these events. Are we closer? on the structure of these events. Uh, we have, kind of looks like the other team, competitor find 66, and then the other team. Mm -mm -mm. Score. <laughs> undefined, undefined, beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Uh, let's go back to here. What do we got? Competitors. Okay, so ID is legit. Um, I had collapsed this, but, oh, I guess maybe we want to do this. Team.id, team.display name. That's also legit. 
logos at one href that seems legit. Uh, where was the score? Let me collapse logos. I don't think we need that. Oh, that's because score is an object. So competitor.score dot, let's do display value. That works. Uh, and then who was the winner record? Winner was just on the top level here. So does that get us any closer to what we're looking for? Can't read property display value. Okay. Mm -mm -mm -mm. This was in the score. Let's see where we're, where we're differing here from what we thought. So let me just log out competitor.score. I do, I'm like now starting to think maybe that was a decent idea to go transform tools, this entire thing into a TypeScript type because then you don't have to guess. You know, you're not trying to figure out, hmm, what exactly am I doing here? Um, I'll just get rid of this other console log for the sake of clarity here. I mean, we all console log. That's the way to do it, right? That's how you, that's how the pros, that's how the pros debug. Oh, okay. So this makes sense. You're looking up the schedule, right? But if they haven't played yet, there's no score, which is totally valid, right? This is a game that's happening in the future. So we're starting to, to work through some of these edge cases um, or other cases, I guess, that we just haven't handled in our UI. So if there is no score, I guess we probably just want to make this entire thing... Um, just make it null, I guess. So this is only if there is, I guess it doesn't really matter. We could do other team, favorite team. Sure. If favorite team score is a legit thing, then we're going to actually put these scores on here. And let's put the display value here because we want to check if that entire object exists. So that's actually fine, right? Nice. Yeah, so there's only a couple that have actually played out of the entire schedule, right? Sometimes bad types are more misleading than no types. <laughs> that's a really good point. Um, so that seems fine. Let me go back to here and I'll just log. Or, oh. Get rid of that and let's try logging out these events again. Okay, we have some legit data here. The first game, we have a real score. We have winner, true. And the other game, we have winner, true. Other game, winner, true, winner, true, winner, true, winner, true. Winner, true. And then we have some undefined. And that makes sense because these games haven't been played, so they're undefined, right? Um, what we could do in terms of kind of what our UI is handling right now, we haven't handled the case where this is actually, um, you know, showing games that haven't been played in the future. So we don't want to handle that yet. I also noticed a bug here with name and logo. So what we actually want is, whoops, we want the other team dot name and not logo. And then in terms of this events array, what we want here is what? There was only like five games that have been played so far. So what we could do is, I'm trying to remember the exact thing, but I think it's um, only the, I think it's dot splice. Um, th there's multiple ways of doing it. Only the first five elements. I think it's like dot splice. No. <laughs> Events dot splice dot split. Splice split. Only the first five elements in the events array. Yeah. 
events.slice, zero to five. Thank you. Zero, four. Okay. Now, what do we want to do? Um, let's comment this. Well, console.log events.splice. <laughs> Somebody in here is, is thank you, uh, cup of crazy for your contribution there. You know the JavaScript methods better than myself, that is for sure. Okay, so this looks this looks legit. We have an array of objects with the team name, logo, score, winner. Yeah, I mean that's that's basically all that we've handled so far. So events.slice zero to five, map over those, and then do image event dot was it logo? Is that what we did? Yeah, event.logo. That's that's gonna bother me. We we'll wanna change that. Uh, event.name, event.score. And this is interesting because previously we decided like, oh, I'll make this the TypeScript true type, but it might actually be easier here to do like uh, event dot winner, which could be true or false. And I think we'll also want to add some more types in here. Logo, name, uh, score is a string, and winner is a Boolean. So let's go back up and change this type. Still, well, it's not optional now because we're including it on all of them, but it is Boolean, right? So I'm good with that. Um, so what am I missing? I need a key. I think that's why it's not showing up on the screen. Um, it isn't wrong though. You can eliminate all the others with length. True, that is true. Um, we got a key of, I guess, we might want to actually pull an ID out here just so we're not actually keying on name. But for the sake of this thing, let's just key on the name. And we can hide this. Okay. Now what? Where's my elements? Where are they at? That is a good question. Uh, missing a return. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, let's do that. Let's go. We have some real data on the screen. How about that? Let's go. It's been a journey. <laughs> we have went from the undocumented API uh, into something real here. Um, I'm pretty happy with that. This actually looks good too. Like this is, it, it's funny because you can't really tell what a design looks like until you get some real data in there. So I'm pretty happy with this. I think this is starting to look really, really good. Um, as a reminder, um, maybe add in rank if the team has it. Can't leave out that number one that <laughs> I've state beat. Yeah, that is actually uh, very important, right? If you look at the, the design here, uh, if you were to look at the schedule, you'll see that we actually just beat the number one team in the nation, North Carolina, no longer number one, rip. <laughs> so we got to have that on there. That's a monumental one. I was actually at the last, I was at the game the last time I would say beat a number one team. It was in 2016 versus Oklahoma. Fun fact. I don't know if there's other college basketball fans here, but I love love me some college basketball. Um, let's handle the, the case where they haven't played yet, right? So if there's no score or winner and this game hasn't played, we, well, first off, we don't want to slice this array anymore. And let's go back up into here. 
basically this entire block of score. Yeah, basically this entire block of score is going to be conditional. And I think what we might want to do actually is move this text gray from this P itself. Well, actually, I don't think we can do that. I was going to say move it up to the top div element, but then we're also using class colors down here. So that could be kind of confusing, but let's, um, let's cut this and we'll do another conditional. Now, again, this is something where people have opinions, whether they want to do kind of conditionals in line, whether they want to like cut this out and do something like if score do this. Otherwise, return and do this. I'm kind of of the camp of I like doing it all in line until it feels like it's too much and I can't comprehend what is going on, right? Uh, question here, what are you setting the type font? So this is using, right now it's just using system UI. So in this instance, it is uh, San Francisco on my Mac. I would probably use enter before I push this to prod so that it looks the same across Mac and Windows because the system font would be different. And uh, there was also a question here about in Next 13, the way you write code is equivalent to get static props. So by default, if I do this fetch, right, this is essentially equivalent to get static props. I'm fetching some data. It's going to make it static by default. So if I reload this page 100 times in my production build, it's not gonna do a fetch every single time, right? It's gonna extract that out. This is static data. So functionally similar there. If I wanted to make this dynamic data, I can override the cache here and use different caching policies, essentially. Um, so let's go back here. If there's a score, then, or if there's maybe a win is even more obvious. If there's a win, then we want to do what we had before. Uh, what? is wrong with that. If there's a win, we'll do that. Is that right? What's he complaining about here? Condition. See, this is where it gets a little weird, like a conditional within a conditional, right? You might want to do something like this. Again, this is kind of all personal preference. You could actually pull this up and do a inline component here. You could pull it out into a separate component. Function win. I mean, I don't know. I feel like, I feel like it's a bit much to pull it out into a separate component. I don't know that, that maybe that's just me. Uh, so yeah, if when do, well, I guess this is where it gets a little weird. It's like, if when do, wait, it can't be when, because we were all, the other conditional was on when. It's if when even exists. So maybe if there's no win or there's no score, maybe we'll just score. If there's a score, do this. Otherwise, uh, nah. <laughs> so the nice thing here, and you'll see, I can just kind of delete this. Um, since I remove that uh, splice, we start to get the rest of the schedule here. And I can kind of evaluate whether this nested ternary here is too much for my brain to comprehend or if it's clear enough. I feel like it's, it's probably fine. I don't think I, I don't hate it. Um, so this is gonna be like text gray 700, 11, 27, 9 p.m. Central time. So we're, we're closer, I think. Look at that real data just flowing in. It's great. Now I can actually design my UI and make it look uh, the way I want it to. Off topic, question. Is it possible to use more than one font with the font optimization feature? Yes, absolutely. Um, maybe in a future stream, I'll actually show how to use fonts to 
to tweak this a little bit further. But I think what I want to do now is get the date. I don't think it's actually shown in this one anywhere. But basically like this, right? We have all these different dates some point in the future. We want to kind of format these in a, a little bit more friendly way. So what are we working with here? What data do we get from the API? So on competitions, if we go back to here, or wait, comp the word competition and competitor is way too similar. Why did they do this? <laughs> Event.competitions.0.com competitors. Well, we actually don't need any of that. We just need event.competitions at zero and then it's dot date. It looks like an ISO timestamp. So what we really want is something like this. That gives us the date. And then if we go down to here, this is a, I, I guess we could, you know, if we wanted to, we could parse this into a date right now. And then we have the actual date object to manipulate and use. Otherwise, we could just keep passing this as a string. I don't feel too strongly either way, but let's just roll with it like this. So we've got date here. We've got date here. We've got, and it's probably time to start abstracting this out into its own type, right? Uh, what do we got here? Where was this at? This is, yeah, we probably want these to be the exact same type, honestly. Uh, they're slightly different right now, but that's a, a future optimization. We have the date. Let's take this. And okay. We have real dates that look correct. Now we want to format this. <laughs> Let's see. If, uh, let's see if Copilot can figure out the API that I need for this. So we have a date string. What we, this is basically what we want to do. We want to convert the ISO date string into a date object and then format it like, format it as a string, like uh, day date, month, month, uh, I don't remember the, the, is it H? It's our, yeah, like that. I don't remember what the PM AM one is. So we're going to see if it figures out the two locale string for me. Date, new date from the ISO time string, day, two digit, month, two digit, hour, two digit, minute, two digit. Okay. It thinks I'm in Great Britain. <laughs> uh, sure. You know, honestly, not bad. Not a bad first attempt getting that in there. I think based on my knowledge of the, uh, the I N T L web API and the two locale string versus date functions, like the popular NPM package, I think I've ran into this before where if you want to start getting more stylistic changes, like you want to do no comma and then, uh, no numbers and like lowercase PM, I think that's when you might need to eject to date functions. I actually don't know if you can do all of that with the to locale string method. Um, date to locale string, lowercase pm. Let's find out. You can copy paste the API data in this tool and generate a Zod schema. Yeah, transform tools is the goat. It's the goat. Uh, what do we got here?
What other options? What other options are we working with? Okay, here's somebody saying use month equals long, day equals numeric. I mean, worth a shot. Month, long, day, numeric. So, yeah, that's not bad. Um, it doesn't match what I was looking for. What I was looking for is essentially like 12, 17, uh, 9 p.m. Or even p.m.? I don't know. It's, it's honestly not that bad right now because I might want... So the, there's pros, pros and cons really to all of this, right? The leading zero, it might be overkill, but it might also align nicely when you have two digits. Um, what I think we need to do, I actually haven't done this with Tailwind before, but there's this CSS property that allows you to set the, it's like, what is it called? It's like CSS tabular number width or something font variant numeric no that's not it there is something that allows you to like make all of your numbers be the same width so that you don't get the situation where like the one is taking up a little bit less space than the two I think there's a way and I think inter does a really good job about this too I think there's a way that allows you to. Lining figures aligned by their baseline. Okay. This is where, this is, yeah, this is where Tailwind comes in. Proportional figures, proportional widths rather than uniform tabular. Okay. All right. Let's try, let's try this. We'll try lining nubs and then we'll try proportional. Uh, okay, I don't see much of a change there because I think we're looking for proportional. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't see, I don't see anything different, but I know there is a way to do this in some, in some way. Maybe your font has to also support this. I don't know. Well, anyways, I think that's probably a good place to, to stop the stream for today. I think we made some, some good progress on, on burning this down. We could go a bit further if we wanted to, you know, put some, some headings in here and actually write some more Tailwind code. Um, what, uh, what do y'all think? Like, I feel like the schedule part wouldn't be too bad. This is essentially an H2, uh, with a font semi bold and a font to Excel and schedule. Well, I've already started now, so I guess I got to do it. <laughs> I'll do a little bit more, and then we'll wrap up the stream. Uh, font semi bold, font two XL schedule, and then below it is an H three that. Well, this was the one we were wanting. Again, font semi bold. Uh, I think we'll just leave the normal size here. We got full schedule. And let's see. This needs to be, this needs to be, is it, oh, is it text? Yeah, it's text to Excel, not font to Excel. This needs to be text gray 700. And we need maybe a little margin top. Two XL is too big, and that's too much margin. Okay, that looks 
closer. Uh, we also need... It needs to have a left margin so that it's the same amount over as, what was it, four? As the icons. Or no. I think what I'm missing is I'm missing the container padding. Because this is the correct amount of padding for the left, but the actual rows. Yeah. Yeah. That looks better. That is closer. This design process is chef kiss for me. Like this is what I really love doing is bridging this gap between design and development and Tailwind and Figma give me the tools, the vocabulary, the workflow that make it possible to move from something static, hook it up to a real API, get data on the page and actually validate and build the ideas that I'm looking for. I think I noticed one other thing here, which is I think these are not the right aspect ratio. This image is at 20 by 24, and I'm guessing it's getting pushed by the parent container being a flex. So what we might want to do here, and there's multiple ways you can handle this, but if it's 24, I think that's, is it four? Height, six, sorry. Got to get my multiples right. Height six, width six. Well, do we want 20 or do we want 24? Let's do five. Perfect. Okay, subtle change, very subtle. But now you see that we're actually respecting the aspect ratio here. Because the parent container was flex, it was messing this up. So now we're setting height width, yeah. Yeah, nice. That is looking really good. Thanks for hanging out and checking this out, learning more about how to move from Figma and building kind of a streamlined version of ESPN all the way into your Next.js site using Tailwind, actually moving this into a real live site. I'm gonna push up this code at ncaam.versal.app if you wanna check it out. I'll also put it on GitHub. And this is gonna be available on YouTube as well too if you wanna rewatch anything, see the design process as I kind of moved throughout uh, the building of this and some of the design critique that I gave. Um, so thanks for, for tuning in and hanging out. This was a ton of fun. And I will catch you in the next stream. Peace.